So what do you think? Where does the first ever V8 engine come from? Where was it made? I mean, it's gotta be America, right? After all, it's the home of the V8, and the V8 is the heart of every muscle car. It's common knowledge, in fact, that the first ever V8 engine was brought down from the heavens in the talons of a bald eagle. Yeah, that's not true. The first ever V8 engine actually comes from a country that could be called the national polar opposite of America. You might have guessed it already. The first ever V8 engine was in fact patented and made by a Frenchman under the name of Leon Levavasol in the country of, of course, Le France. <laughs> Leon Levavasseur. 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 I think I need to pronounce my term more. <laughs> Other than looking like the ship captain from every Disney movie ever, Mr. Levavasseur was also a genius inventor and engineer. He was born in 1863 and initially studied fine arts. But quickly he realized that he was a true engine head, so he quit fine arts and started studying engineering. Now this was a good decision with great timing in fact, because by the time Mr. Levasseur was in his late 30s and a well-versed engineer, something big was happening in the world. The dawn of the 20th century was also the dawn of powered flight, and the early 1900s saw many many different pioneers experimenting with countless different airplane designs. But for flight to be powered you need, well, power and not just any power not man power and helpless flapping of your arms you need serious power that could keep you in the air for longer than a few seconds and for serious power you need an engine and while many pioneers of powered flight tried to make their engines as small as possible and as light as possible by sacrificing displacement or the number of cylinders or both, uh, Mr. Leon Levasseur had a different idea. He believed an engine didn't have to be miserable and look like a toaster in order to be capable of flight. He believed an engine could do both, big power and light weight. But to make that happen, he needed money, of course, don't we all? So in 1902, he approached industrialist and money-equipped person by the name of Jules Gastambide and presented his engineering vision. Unlike some of the slightly pathetic engines in Pioneer airplanes which used one or two or three cylinders, Levavasseur's idea was much more ambitious. He envisioned an engine design with eight cylinders, split into two banks 90 degrees apart from each other. An immortal design that is still incredibly popular today, more than a century after its inception. Needless to say, Gaston Bede was really impressed with the idea and decided to finance the project. In a show of gratitude towards Gaston Bede, Levavasseur named the engine Antoinette, after Gaston Bede's daughter. And in the same year, in 1902, he filed for a secret patent and immediately started working on the engine. The very next year, in 1903, the first ever V8 engine was a functional prototype and went through its first ever combustion cycle. Very soon after the engine became a functional prototype, Levavasseur decided to test out how it would fare in an actual airplane. So from July to September of 1903, he started working on an airplane design and construction in the town of Villotrain in France. The airplane became known as Le Aeroplane de Villotrain, but ultimately was a failure. Although Levavasseur was a great engineer, he wasn't quite yet a master of aerodynamics. And although the airplane was equipped with a really impressive 80 horsepower V8 engine, an incredible power figure for the time, after numerous tests the airplane proved incapable of flight. So Levavasseur got pretty angry, he removed his good engine and burned down the airplane de Villotrain. But both Gaston Bede and Levavasseur knew the engine had potential, so they decided to abandon airplanes for a little while and switch to speedboat racing as proving grounds for the Antoinette engine. Speedboat racing was in fact massively popular in Europe at the time and by the late 1904 almost all the record holding and prize winning speedboats in Europe had an Antoinette engine in them. 
with renewed vigor and reassurance of the potential of the Antoinette engine, Levavasseur returned to airplanes once again. In 1906, the Antoinette company was officially founded. It was called La Société Anonyme Antoinette, and its main business was selling engines to airplane builders. Levavasseur and Gaston Bede were clever. They decided to let somebody else handle all the iffy aerodynamics, and they would focus on what they were good at building engines. Quickly business started booming and many important pioneer airplanes had an Antoinette engine in them. Eventually Levavasseur got the hang of aerodynamics himself and Antoinette started making its own airplanes. They were also called Antoinette 1 to 7. By 1910 Levavasseur built many different engines of various sizes and configurations. But if you think he stopped at V8, you're wrong. Just like memory cards nonchalantly doubling up from 8 to 16 gigabytes, so too did Levavasseur's engines. And in addition to building V8s, he also built V16 engines. He even built giant V24 engines for marine applications. Some even say he built a V32 engine, while others say this particular engine, the V32, never made it past the design phase. And while some contest the fact that Levavasseur invented the V8, the fact that he was the first to build V16 and V24 engines is pretty much irrefutable. But what's more impressive than the sheer number of cylinders is how advanced and ahead of their time these engines were. The engines Leon Levavasseur made weren't just the first V8 or V16, they were also the first ever engines made in any quantity to feature fuel injection. Yes, fuel injection, they didn't use a carburetor but instead had a primitive form of mechanical fuel injection. On top of that they were liquid cooled and all of this in the first decade of the 1900s. And although they existed in multiple configurations and different bore and stroke sizes, all of Avasur engines were essentially the same. They all featured individual water-cooled cylinders arranged in a 90-degree V on an aluminum crankcase. To make the engine as short as possible, Levavasseur designed side-by-side -side tubular connecting rods. This means that two rods shared a single crank pin. The pistons were made of cast iron and each cylinder had one intake and one exhaust valve and manifold positioned on the inside of the V of the engine. The intake valve was situated above the exhaust valve, effectively creating an F-shaped cylinder head. The intake valve was atmospheric and this means it was automatically opened by the vacuum created in the cylinder as the piston moved downward. The exhaust valve was a bit more advanced and it was actuated by a pushrod driven by a camshaft. The top of the cylinder's combustion chamber was hemispherical with a single spark plug positioned at its center. And all of this was made in a state-of-the-art workshop that boasted of tolerances down to 0.01 millimeters. This was incredibly accurate for the time and in fact Levasseur's engines were so advanced that once they broke down uh, nobody else could fix them. If there was something that failed the engine had to be shipped back to Levasseur to be repaired. Something else that's really impressive when it comes to Antoinette engines is Levavasseur's pursuit of making everything as light as possible. And he had to do this the hard way. He would make parts from scratch and then test them until they failed. And he would reduce the weight of each new version of the part until he made the lightest possible part for the given task. We have to remember these were the early 1900s. That means no CAD software, no computer simulations, no CNC machines, none of that fancy stuff. It was basically some grease, some metal ingots and a pen and paper. One of the most impressive Antoinette engines was the one developed for flight pioneer Alberto Santos Dumont. It was a very small and very light but also a powerful engine whose power to weight ratio wouldn't be surpassed for quite some time. It was a liquid cooled V8 with a bore of 110 mm and a stroke of 105 mm. It displaced 8 liters but it was very small when it comes to its physical size. On top of that, it weighed in at only 95 kilograms. This was the engine with which Alberto Santos Dumont completed the first ever recorded European flight that was longer than 25 meters and became the first person ever to be filmed in an airplane in flight. 
The Antoinette engines also made it into cars. In 1906, a car powered by an Antoinette engine was presented at the Paris Motor Show. Le Vasseur decided to change his approach when it comes to car engines. In the interest of reliability and longevity, he made the internal engine components more robust. This resulted in a heavier engine with a lower horsepower output, and the Antoinette car engine only put out around 30 horsepower, but had a much longer lifespan compared to its aviation brethren. Another great achievement powered by an Antoinette engine was the first ever recorded UK flight. It was carried out by American Samuel Cody in October of 1908, when he flew a distance of 420 meters using an Antoinette engined aircraft. But Antoinette wasn't just a company that was ahead of its time with its engines and its aviation achievements, it was also ahead of its time with its approach to training pilots. Antoinette was the company that made what could be called the first ever flight simulator. No, it didn't have a display or any electronics. It was just a dude in a half barrel with a universal joint and flight instructors were shaking him from the outside. But the pilot trainee did have some rudimentary controls that he could use to counter the external forces applied by the trainers. And Although this wasn't high-tech and what today would be called a flight simulator, it was still a really innovative approach for the time and definitely a design in the right direction. In 1909, Antoinette engines and aircraft set the world altitude record of 155 meters. The next year, in 1910, they also set the world airspeed record at 77.5 kilometers per hour. Interestingly enough, there's one thing that the Antoinette engines never managed to achieve, and that is to cross the English Channel. Antoinette pilot Hubert Latam tried twice, and although he failed both times, uh, he also became the first ever person to be recorded successfully landing an aircraft into a body of water. The first successful crossing of the English Channel was achieved by former vice president of Antoinette, and he used a much simpler and weaker Anzani engine to do the task. The Anzani engine just had three cylinders in a W configuration and only put out 25 horsepower, but it was much more reliable and better suited to the task compared to the all-or-nothing style of the Antoinette engines. By the end of the decade, you could say that the Antoinette company was sort of getting complacent with their success. They slowed down innovations and improvements to their engine and aircraft designs. The competition started catching up and the company was headed downhill. In 1910, the military rejected an Antoinette monoplane design and the company went bankrupt soon after. But you can't deny that they had a really, really good run and that many aviation firsts and even speedboat firsts were made possible by the amazing engines made by Antoinette company and their designs that were miles ahead of their time. So yeah, that's pretty much the story of the first ever V8 and a bit of history about the really interesting Antoinette company. I hope you found that entertaining and interesting and that you also maybe learned something new in the process. So yeah, as always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel. Leon Levavasseur, 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 Hubert, 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 Gaston Bide, Gaston Bide, Gaston Bide, Gaston Bide, Gaston Bide, Gaston Bide, Hubert, Hubert, Hubert.